It is now fall and our spirit for adventure will take us about as far south and east as you can go and still be in Oregon. We'll stop off on the way since it's fall. The fishing at Chickahominy Reservoir should be pretty fair by now. So we'll go down, throw a hook in, and just see how we can do. We get there sort of late in the day and the moon is already up over Chickahominy Reservoir. The fall moonlight dances on the waters at Chickahominy Reservoir as we try for a fish. A group of geese wing their way across the sunset over Chickahominy Reservoir. We caught no fish that first evening, so we're up and at it at first daylight the next morning, and it looks like they're biting this morning. We'll catch a few of these fish and take it down to the Albert Desert. I'm sure that our friends that are probably already there would enjoy a nice fish meal. Marge caught the first one but it's my turn next as my pole starts dancing and whipping here in the sunrise over Chickahominy Reservoir. Bring him in. Bring him in, Tom. Lift him up. Okay, lift him up. He wants all the bad. There's a net here, I can get him. He's a dadly too. Yeah, he's a nice one. Look, he's heavy. Yeah. We fish till we figure we have enough fish for a good fish feed on the desert. Then we load up and head for the desert. A mule deer doe is standing alongside us, grazing away. Too bad there isn't a buck. I have my bow and arrow. We'd have deer meat if there were a buck. As we push southeast, the next sight we see is the Albert Desert out in front of us. This vast wasteland spread out in front of us over a hundred square miles of it. We're going to go down on the desert and see if anyone we know is down here. Once down on the desert, we can buzz along at a real good clip. It's smoother than most of the highways and doesn't have all the rocks that can give you flat tires like the highway up above. We spot Frank's camp out ahead of us. We'll pull up and talk to Frank a while and also we have our land sailor and so we might just leave it at Frank's camp down here. That way we won't have to bring it back to the playa. We usually camp up by the hot springs so Marge can do all of her cooking in the hot springs and no one has to cook that way. We pull up to Frank's camp and it looks like he's here. His doors open on his camp trailer there and also he has a couple friends with him here. So we'll go up and say hi, 
Then we'll head on up to the hot springs for the sunset. The sun is once again creeping down behind the Steens Mountains and darkness will soon be upon us, but at least we can use the hot springs for a little while here this evening. It looks like the water's nice and clear and clean and the old wash machine tubs are still in the bottom of the springs that we use for seats. The next day it looks like the wind is going to blow. So we're going to hook up the land sailor, get it all rigged up, and go out and see if we can get a ride from the wind. The wind's blowing fast enough to get us a real decent ride as it fills our sail and we go screaming across the desert. These machines are steered with your feet and that way both hands are clear for the ropes to regulate the sail. The wind's blowing hard enough to give us a real decent ride out across the playa of the Albert Desert. The wind whips and rattles our sail as we move effortlessly across the playa. Frank's out on the playa too and we're looking for him with his land sailor. Sometimes it's difficult to see him with the mirages, but finally we've spotted Frank, so we'll see if we can catch up to him. Our sails filled with wind and ropes are whipping and popping as we cross the playa at breakneck speed trying to catch up to Frank. Some dust devils are moving through stirring up dust where you can hardly see what's in front of you as they move through. By now briefly we can see a faint image of Frank as he goes sailing past us at a really good clip through the dust. We'll eat and breathe some dust and get a liberal coating of it all over it, but it's all worth it in the long run. Look at how we can go with only the power of nature to propel us. This is what Frank had hoped for, a decent wind and it looks like he's got it and he's having the time of his life out here across the playa. We go out a decent distance away from Frank's camp and see him out there. We try to catch up with him but he's moving along a little too fast for that. We sail along at breakneck speed with the Steens Mountains standing tall in the background behind us. And the wind has filled our sails and you can hear the hammering and flopping of canvases and the whipping of ropes as we move across the playa and just the gentle hum of our tires. As they turn at a speed that wheelbarrow tires were never intended to go, but they work, and so as long as they work, why fix it? And finally, we catch up with Frank. Frank lives and breathes the land sailing, and he has a smile from ear to ear as he comes up next to us. We don't just sail back and forth out here. We go on long journeys that take us for miles across this smooth playa. More dust devils are stirring up out across the playa. And when we see a dust devil, 
That means there will be some wind in front and behind it and alongside it. One of my wheelbarrow wheels is bent a little bit. It broke when I was out sailing one time. So I borrowed Carl's welder and welded it, and I didn't get it completely straight, but it still goes and goes good. It just makes a little more noise and wobbles a little bit, but that's okay as long as we can go. We're losing track of the time as the sun is settling down toward the horizon once again. Time goes so fast when you're out here sailing across the playa. Not every day the wind blows like this, so we better take advantage of it while we can. But I have to quit pretty soon. I was going to fillet some fish so we can have a big fish feed tonight. So I better start winding it down pretty soon here. We have a real decent wind and a clear blue sky with a few streaky white clouds across it. I'm not ready to quit, but I better hurry up and get those fish ready for tonight or everybody's going to be starving just because I sailed too long. Frank sailed in in a little bit and we had an exceptionally good fish feed and potatoes and uh, several other things. Then the next morning I was up right at the first light of day and heading up on the mountain to see if I could find a deer or something. I f saw something move ahead of me. I move up and see that it's a herd of mountain sheep. I'd climb clear to the top of the steens right up under the cliffs and there they were, a herd of three, at least three rams and some ewes and lambs. I've hiked nearly to the top of the steens right under the cliffs, which would be as far as I can go. And there they are, grazing away, and they haven't even noticed me yet. I see there are two of them that have radio collars around their neck. This is put on by the Game Commission. Sometimes they introduce new rams here to get new blood stock in the herd. They're just going on about their business of being sheep. At one time, there were lots of these bighorn sheep in these mountains and hills around the Steens Mountains and all different places in southeast Oregon. But then the ranchers came in with domestic sheep. The domestic sheep brought diseases and also hunters killed a lot of these sheep as well as predators to where now there are very few of them left. And I have the privilege of seeing this little herd of about a dozen of them right on top of one of the alpine meadows nearly to the top of the Steens Mountains. What a privilege to see these magnificent beasts grazing away as they probably have for centuries on top the Steens Mountains. The little ram, the farthest in the background, is one with the radio collar around his neck so the game commission can keep track of him. It's just the beginning of the rut for the mountain sheep and these little rams are starting to get the idea by now. There's no fighting and no big rams yet so the rut really hasn't got underway much yet. There are two young rams that are probably about three years old. 
grazing away up on top of the Steens Mountains with a few juniper and a little bit of the hilltop mahogany growing around. It's a rare privilege to be up here right in the midst of these great animals. It's only reserved for a few people because it's a several mile hike up the Steens Mountains. Quite a bit of elevation gain too. The cliffs right behind where the animals are is the summit of the Steens Mountains and the canyon with all these many little streams all those green spots are streams where water's running down and they all combine together to make Pike Creek which flows out and is lost in the desert out beyond. From up here you can see the whole world. The Albert Desert is out in front of us and way out beyond it almost obscured by the smoke is Coyote Lake. It's another dry playa out there, only smaller than the Albert Desert. The mountain sheep are up in the higher elevations during the spring, summer, and fall, and then in the winter when the snow gets too deep, they move on down to lower ground where they have good feed for the winter. The winds shift slightly, and it looks like the young ram in the foreground has figured out I'm here, while the other ram with the radio collar around his neck seems to be unaware that I'm around. But at least one ram is going to watch and just see what in the world I am. He's alerted the rest of the flock and so they're going to leisurely move off a little farther away from me. Leisurely and carefree, they move behind the rock and out the other side, or the one ram is still going to keep an eye on me, but I guess he's decided by now that I'm not that much of a threat. So he'll just watch a little bit as the rest of the herd moves on, having a little bit of grass on their way. I wouldn't mind spending the whole day up here watching these beasts as they feed across the alpine plain up here, but I have to be heading back down. I've got a way, quite a ways to go and it'll be dark for too terrible long. I'll take one last look at the big Pike Creek Basin and then head down. The east slope of the Steens Mountains is a very different place. It has all sorts of rock formations. Some of this is a sedimentary rock that's been eroded away to look like about any kind of shape you could you could want up on top this ledge. I get down the mountain and meet up with Marge and she wants to go up and check the old orchard out. So we're going up and check this legacy that was left here by the mercury miners, Mike and Jim Weston, and we find peaches, pears, and apples. I meet up with Kent and we decide to go out across the playa and find the moving rocks have moved and left their trails. We're going to go out and see if we can find some of the wild horses of the Albert Desert. We move across the playa into the sagebrush plain on the other side and there they are, a herd of wild horses. This is a little family harem here with a big stallion, a yearling mare, and a mare and a colt. The stallion in the group was a big macho 
sorrel stallion bigger than most. While the mares and colts were feeding, he was watching for danger. And when he finally sees danger, then he keeps it between himself and the mares. Very protective of his little family group of mares and colts. I shoved the camera in the hands of Kent and I went up behind him to see if I could bring him out by Kent. To my surprise, I walked almost right up on him as I crossed over a ridge and the stallion challenged me time after time again. He puts that tail out to make himself look bigger and he certainly looked big. I was trying to figure a strategy out in case he came after me. And one of the things that wasn't in my strategy was to run. I knew he could outrun me 10 to 1. So I guess the only thing I could have done was try to bluff him back by holding my arms out and looking big and mean. Maybe I could have yelled a little bit. And if that didn't work, there's always plain dead as an option. He was the biggest, prettiest, slickest sorrel stallion I've ever seen, and he would almost be too big for a saddle horse, but he knows his way around the desert here, and no one's ever going to get a rope, halter, or saddle on him. He probably has fought many a battle out here on the sagebrush of the Albert Desert for his little harem, and he plans on keeping them. I'm moving on over a little closer there, and he keeps looking back and giving me a challenge. Here I come, right through the little saddle, and he's going to move ahead a little bit and then turn and watch me. What a rush to be so close to such a huge old stallion. And he was so pretty and he kept challenging me with those many snorts that he made. And those snorts could be heard for hundreds of yards. So he walked all the way out in there. Got that close. Okay, I th think they see me too. I walked up here a little bit because they were just behind the ridge. Okay, he sees me, he doesn't like it. <clears throat> He's heading right for Tom. Actually, if Tom comes back out of that canyon, they're gonna come right head to head. And he still sees me standing here. And I don't think the rest of them are following yet. Just the stallions out here. Now you can hear Tom coming, and so can he. My bet is he'll go back to the north, but we'll see. That would be away from water. He may not want that. He's still not being followed. The rest of them are just over this ridge line. I know it doesn't look like a ridge line, but there's just a bit of a sand dune right there.
the big sorrel stallion just stands and watches as the mares are off in a little draw. But pretty soon, here they come, and they're coming this way. But first, we couldn't figure this out. The stallion is sticking his nose in the air and snorting. And here comes the old mare, the yearling, and the colt. We couldn't figure out why the horses were coming back toward us until later we found a good reason for it. What a pretty little family, and probably all of them are his offspring except the old mare herself. Through drought and blizzards alike and thunderstorms and winds and snowstorms and drifting snow, these hardy survivors of the desert have made it their home and here's where they live. And the magnificent stallion trots through the sagebrush in a challenging manner. His tail is out to make him look even bigger and more intimidating. This is a survival tactic that's been handed down for generations. Even though it looks like he's enjoying it immensely as he snorts that spine tingling snort. Time after time, he'll stick his head in the air and give out that big snort. What a beautiful animal and what a sight to see him going in his challenging manner out through the sagebrush, stirring up the dust as he turns and snorts time and time again. And the mares and colts, they're moving on. These horses have only been out here for a few hundred years. They were reintroduced to North America by the Spanish, the early explorers, and then it was really a natural for them, the desert. They have done extremely well out on the deserts. There's a trail of dust as they move off through the sagebrush with the sorrel stallion in the lead. The Steens Mountains standing guard in the background as the dust settles. They run out to a safe distance and again stop and turn and watch us. We're still trying to figure out why they didn't want to go north. We move a little farther north and we find an exceptionally good reason. Here's two satellite stallions and the big sorrel stallion although he could have taken on both of these at once, would rather not spend the energy for a fight. And if he'd have moved up here, it would have probably been a fight. And he knew they were there. The one sorrel stallion looks a whole lot like the big sorrel stallion. I think it's probably his two-year-old. And then there's one older stallion out in the edge of the sand dunes as they gracefully trot across by an old windmill that hasn't been used in years. There were windmills every little ways out here at one time, but ranching has changed since then, and so there's, they aren't maintained anymore. But there are some water holes if you know where to find them. And there's drifting sand dunes that we go through on the little roads. Kent knows of a nice water hole where I've never been. So we're going to go see if we can find it. And there it is, right in front of us. A whole bunch of cattails, and these cattails have real tall stems, 
with those are totally huge cattails. Blossoms on them. We walk around and see many a horse track, probably yeah. the sorrel stallion walk. Those horses have really chewed the devil out of those cattails. There's quite a large, deep pool at one spot. And the horse trail winds right into the water here. Where they can water and also browse a little. The horses have pulled the grass up in little bunches and chewed the seeds off and spit the rest out. And the seeds are pretty well gone. See, they've chewed them off. Yeah. That's, that's crazy. We're going to eat more than a little bit of dust on our way back to the playa through the sand dunes and the dust fields here. But it's well worth it. Where else in the world could you go and have an experience like this? We make it back to the playa and Kent turns to go toward his camp and I'll turn the other direction and go towards our camp at the last light of day. I check on the moving rocks that leave trails once again, and this one's left a real decent trail across the playa. I return to our camp as the sun is setting low on the horizon of the Steens Mountains. Another very successful day. The next morning, I saw some old vultures circling. So, of course, out of curiosity, I had to go see what they were circling. I snuck up on the spot where they were, and it was a jackrabbit that someone had ran over on the road. First, there were some small buzzards. The larger buzzard comes and tries to drive them away. There's one kind of big buzzard that he can't seem to get to move, though. But it's a pretty equal match, so they'll just go ahead and all feed a little bit here till another bigger buzzard drops out of the sky. And then it'll be time to get out of there. The buzzards feed away as fast as they can. But uh-oh, here comes trouble, dropping in from the skies above with the Steens Mountains in the background. He circles very cautiously for a few times and then drops straight in on the edge of the road and walks over to take his rightful place as the head buzzard of the kill. He's being extremely careful, circling and circling and circling to see that there's not a coyote or a bobcat or something waiting there to catch him. Then he moves down lower and lower and lower and finally sets down right on the edge of the road. Once he drops in, it's going to change things at the kill. The other buzzards look smaller than him. He stands there for a minute as if he's resting from his flight. And then it's time to get things straightened out a little bit right at the kill. First thing that's got to go is this little buzzard here. The rest of the buzzards better run because it looks like the head buzzards arrived. Okay, guy, we don't need you here. You're making too much of a hog yourself. So we'll run you off. And as for you, maybe I'll let you have another bite or two here while I think this situation over and 
you buzzard, you can get out of here too. Matter of fact, I think I could eat the whole thing myself. So why don't all you buzzards get out of here? After getting everything straight in the buzzard community, it reminded me that I'm hungry too, and I could sure use some of those nice, fresh, ripe plums up at the orchard. So I grabbed Marge, and we're going up and test the fruit and see how it's going to be. And wow, those plums are excellent. And my gosh, what nice peaches. Those are the best peaches I've ever seen. And they're growing here with no attention. No fertilizer, no water, and no care. But wow, look what nice peaches and apples all over the ground and pears, the trees almost breaking down with wild pears and enough apples here to make a barrel of cider. A lot of this fruit is falling off under the trees. So that's where we picked our pears up that we were going to eat. And wow, were they good. That evening after we got back from the orchard, I could see a plume of smoke up on the Steens Mountains, but I understand it was just a controlled burn. We're very fortunate the wild sunflowers are blooming all along the trails this year. Usually they're pretty much done for by this time, but it's been a really good year for them, and they're spreading their beauty all the way from higher up on the Steens down to the desert itself. I rode out on the desert to take another look at the plume of smoke, and it does look to be a controlled burn. They burn that sagebrush off so it can grow more grass and beneficial things for livestock and wild game alike. The next morning, it made the sunrise fairly red, but wow, what a pretty sunrise to wake up to as the sun moves its way skyward out across the Albert Desert. I'll go to the hot springs where I can enjoy it properly. Looks like it's going to be another beauty of a day nice and warm and sunny and no wind that means no wind for frank to sail with today though but he'll be able to find something else to do kent comes back over and we have another outing plan for today we're going to go up on top of the mountain and see if we can find the old mercury melting furnace up by the old cabin up on the bench on the foothills of the Steens Mountains. A few bees are working in the early morning light to extract a little bit of pollen. Marge has her camera there taking some pictures of these sunflowers. A praying mantis is down near the hot springs we move on up to see if we can find the old mercury furnace. And there it is. And it's the typical of all the old mining stuff. It's all handmade with rocks and old car parts. You just use what's around you and what's available. And it seems to work just fine. The old miner shack is almost to fall in now. We go on out after that to see if we can find some more wild horses and we find another harem out near the big sand gap. They're moving up a little closer to us although this herd of horses doesn't seem to be nearly as gentle as the one we saw the day before. We so see no real outstanding stallion here like the sorrel stallion, but I imagine any of these stallions could give a good fight. 
Gary and Donald have gone along with us this time too. They want to see some of the wild horses. So we stop and watch the horses at the sand gap and the horses are moving closer and closer almost as if they were curious as to what we were. There was a nice little herd of six horses here with one really outstanding shiny black one amongst them. They stood at attention and watched us for a while till pretty soon they decided they'd had enough of it and they whirled and made a cloud of dust as they moved back out of sight through the sagebrush covered hills of the Albert Desert. They whirl and they're gone almost as fast as they appeared with only a cloud of dust left as they head in to the sagebrush covered canyon. Pause for a moment to say goodbye to Kent and Gary and Donald and I will travel across the playa to where we're camped on the other side. There's going to be a full moon tonight over the hot springs. The desert will be lit up almost as if it were daylight. The next morning I'm up early before the sun ever rises. I'm heading up to go on a really long hike. I'm going to once again hike to the summit of the Steens Mountains right under the cliffs and see if I can see some wildlife. The scenery is spectacular. As I get up high in some of the cliffs I can see some of the very unusual rock formations. I'm going up a different route than I went a few days ago. This time I'm going up on the left side of the little mountain up there that has the hilltop mahogany on it. I climb miles and miles up and there it is the summit of the Steens Mountains right ahead of me and I'll go right to the base of it. I saw very little wildlife that day and when I get back what a treat. Frank has a big potluck dinner planned for us. We're having barbecued salmon and wow does it look good. Frank's carefully checking to see if it's done. Pam and her dog will be joining us tonight for dinner right out on the playa of the Albert Desert and Donald will be there too as long as as well as Frank and Elsie. Evelyn, Pam's little dog, is there taking it all in with us and behaving herself very well. Evelyn looks hungry too, as well as everyone else, as the fish is slowly cooking in Frank's barbecue. Frank has even baked some potatoes under the salmon, which were very good too. And Donald is taking a few pictures, just so we can remember it. And Frank's wind sailor lays just beyond us. Frank gives a final diagnosis. Everything is done as the moon rises across the Albert Desert right behind Frank's windsock. So we'll hurry and eat our dinner and then go to the hot springs and test the hot water under a full moonlit night. Marge and I have ridden our little Honda down to Frank's camp where we can savor every second of that 
beautiful moonlit night across the Albert Desert. The whole group of us gather around the hot springs as well as Evelyn, Pam's little dog, to watch the moon as it slowly creeps its way skyward, reflecting on the white surface of the Albert Desert. Marge and I are winding our trip down by now, but we still have time to go to Mickey Hot Springs. This is a super hot central pool with a ditch leading out to a little hot spring that you can use some of the time. It's hot. Is it too hot? It's pretty warm. I guess we'll wash some of the dust off. There's gurgling and hissing and snorting as steam is being vented from deep down in the center of the earth. At one time these pools had water in them and they were bubbling mud pots, but due to the drought, only some of them have water. And there's a bubbling mud pot right in front of my eyes here. It looks like there's a good amount of activity at the hot springs as they're gurgling and popping and boiling right in front of my eyes. Some of the pools are quite deep and you can look down into like little volcanoes while others are just popping and gurgling. We hop on the Honda and negotiate the 20 miles of dusty road back to our campsite where we're going to start packing and we want to have a day to spend at Chickahominy Reservoir to see if we can catch some more of those big rainbow trout. Behind us we're leaving such a cloud of dust that we can scarcely see our own shadow as the sun sinks lower over the Steens Mountains and shines across the slick surface of the Albert Desert. By the time we reach our camp, we're going to need to go down to the hot springs and wash off a little dust, right as the sun sets over the Steens Mountains. The dust is all nice clean dust, and I guess you sorta become addicted to it. The next morning finds us at the hot springs again. Only this morning we'll just go in briefly and then we're heading for Chickahominy as soon as we get the sun up. The Albert Hot Springs is still a very special place to us after going there that many years and particularly that's at the first sunrise of the morning as Fresh hot water trickles into our pool from the pipes coming from the hot springs. We're underway by now and we see a cloud of dust. Everything has its cloud of dust. And this morning it's some of the local ranchers having a small cattle drive. The rear view mirror looks as though we're stirring up our own little cloud of dust behind us as we move farther northward. As we reach Chickahominy Reservoir, we hurry and cast our lines in the water and find the fish are biting quite well. So we're going to see if we can catch several of these great big old fat rainbow trout and they are the very best of eating. Okay. 
Vedi. Where's the net? Get up here and hold him up and we'll get a picture. Yeah, hold him up and let's see what he looks like. Hold him up. Out this way. Turning. Yeah. There. Turning. This way? Yeah. A little higher. There. Yeah. Now turn him a little. Nice one. Where's that net? I better get it. Wait. Here's your net. Okay. He's not a super big one. One at a time, we hmm. catch all the fish we want to take home with us out of the waters at Chickahominy Reservoir here. And they're really nice big fish, and they're biting Okay, I'll get really the net handy. Today. right through till the sun touched the water at Chickahominy Reservoir yeah and then we gather up our fish and it's That's time looking to good. start packing up and heading home the next morning we're underway to go home as soon as the sun comes up over the picnic table and lighting the desert we're into our vehicle and heading out.